Welcome to the Aerospace Executive Podcast, featuring in-depth conversations with executives, leaders, influencers, and journalists in this dynamic, high-stakes industry. Hosted by Craig Pickett, founder of Northstar Group, the boutique executive search firm for the aerospace industry. You'll learn how top aerospace executives are developing their people, competing for talent, overcoming challenges, and adjusting to industry trends to drive growth and profits. And now, let's join your host, Craig Pickett. James, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Craig. How are you? All right. So as we were, as we were just discussing, the topic today is uh, the boomer versus millennial generations. And uh, yeah, are, are we talking Republican Democrat, or can we find a can we find a happy medium in between? How's that sound? <laughs> I think there's definitely a medium to be found. There may be some uh, some correlation between those two, but uh, that's uh, maybe a topic for another time. So for uh, for everybody who uh, for all the uh, the great responses I've been getting on these podcasts, including one email I just received a few minutes ago. Um, they they they're, they're definitely hitting a hit on a point. And for for those of you who don't know, James Durham is my producer. So uh, he helps me put all these things together. And and James is a 27 year old graduate of uh, Notre Dame. What was your major in Notre Dame, James? Majored in marketing. Uh, so went through their their business program. So uh, you went through Notre Dame's business program. Got a uh, got a high powered education. And you decided to move out to California, like all people do, and uh, start to start your career there. That's right. Uh, yeah, and I came to Notre Dame uh, after growing up in in Tennessee. I lived out in a, a rural area and, and kind of had the, I guess what I would call maybe the classical outlook on uh, getting an education, getting a job, and and working towards retirement and making sure that you're secure, like for the long run. And, and, uh, and I've, I've maybe gone off the rails a little bit, uh, since then. Well, you, you guys, you, you've kind of taken an entrepreneurial, you know, entrepreneurial track. You didn't, uh, you didn't join a, didn't join a big company. Um, you guys have got a, a good little small business going out there helping other small businesses. What do you, what are you learning? Yeah. So, and just to give a little bit of a, a picture on our business. So um, our company, Pursuing Results, we, uh, like you said, Craig, we produce podcasts. So we have a, a batch of, uh, of shows that we help produce. So um, using a lot of the, the tools that are kind of hot right now in whether it's social media or media in general. So, you know, we're working with uh, video content on YouTube and, and audio podcasting with iTunes and all these things like that that are uh, that are kind of hot right now uh, to varying degrees. But um, yeah, but we're very small. Um, we're very much kind of doing our own thing and, and carving our own path and, and learning as we go along. And to give you a little background too, uh, prior to this, I've only been doing this uh, for about a year now. Prior, I was in more of a corporate setting or closer to a corporate setting, um, working in insurance. And it was much more of a stable kind of nine to five, uh, plotting more systematic thing. And, uh, and it, and it was great for a lot of reasons. Um, but I, I think for me, there were, there were also reasons to, um, to, like I said, veer off course a bit. What were your expectations coming out of college? I mean, when you, you went to college, what were the expectations, not just to you, but you know, all your classmates? Was it, you know, uh, you know, for a 25, 22, 23, 24-year-old student coming out of you know, Notre Dame or you know, mm -hmm. one of the better schools, you know, what, were you, what were you shooting for? I think there's definitely an expectation that, that whatever you want, you can – you can attain. Uh, you've got this momentum going from, you know, your your four years of undergrad, whatever that might be. If if you want to study accounting and, and do that fifth year, become a CPA, you can do that, and you're going to get scooped up by KPMG or Deloitte or one of these big firms or something like that. So you've kind of got the way paid for you. If you're uh, going a different route uh, in finance or management, whatever that might be, you're going to build these connections. And Notre Dame specifically, I mean, like a, a lot of schools have a, a strong alumni network. So, the, so that feeds into that concept that if I, if I do my job here, like in school and, and I'm, uh, 
focused and, and hardworking that there will be a path laid before me if I choose to choose to pursue it. And a lot of times that it's within the scope of joining kind of corporate America or starting at starting at a, a lower rung in the ladder uh, with the expectation that you will uh, work your way up through. And, and I mean, ultimately having like financial security, that's, that's kind of what, what I felt like under was underlying it for a lot of people was the, um, the kind of guarantee or semi guarantee of being able to, to kind of build wealth long term. You didn't hear as much talk about uh, following specific passions or interests or things like that. But again, that's different for everybody. So that so they're really what you know. So one of the big you know one of the big uh, things that you know. So okay, I'm I'm squarely middle aged. Let's just you know, put it out. Let's just put it out there. My birthday's Friday. I uh, I will be more firmly implanted in middle age on Friday. But you know, a lot of people keep telling me, "Hey, look, you know, the, the young kids today they want to come in and they want to start at the top. Um, obviously, very very tech savvy. Uh, get frustrated with the slowness of companies." When you when you were being recruited, you know what you know, what did you what did you guys like? What you know what what were the companies telling you that you really enjoyed? What were you saying that hey look that's that's not for me? That's a great question. So definitely the being able to like for a company to be able to paint a picture or outline the path to kind of become uh, become somebody with more freedom or agency or responsibility, wherever that was, like you said, that, that yes, there are, there are a lot of graduates that come out expecting to have that degree in hand and become immediately the, you know, head of uh, whatever department or product manager, or whatever that is. And that's not necessarily the case, but for people doing recruiting or companies doing recruiting, if you can, if you can acknowledge uh, that there is that drive or that desire to rise quickly if you can not saying that it'll happen overnight but if you can at least show or allow or um, communicate an understanding that there is a path for that I think that goes a long way but I will say too that that when it came time for like near graduation and when a lot of recruiting is going on there was a little bit of a wake-up call that um, that having a degree is great and, and having a strong skill set is great too, but there's also, there is a time element of it there as well. And, and building real world experience is a, is definitely a factor. So the, uh, the, the, the reality of the matter is, is that, you know, the kids come, you know, kids coming out, kids say kids, you know, the, uh, the, the young executives coming out of college, college graduates, they're like, Hey, look, yeah, we're, we're, we're willing to, we're willing to start where our, you know, our skill sets allow us, and, and learn as much as we can and move up the ladder. Yeah, because I think you you may have high expectations going into uh, like maybe your sophomore junior year, and and hopefully a lot of a lot of people, at least peers and friends of mine, were we were trying to get internships and things during those years that were allowing us to dip our feet into those waters and, and understand kind of what it was all about or what kind of skill set you did have to have or what that. Um, kind of corporate landscape looked like. But one other thing I wanted to mention though, that was a, an interesting phenomenon I know I saw then, and it may have changed or matured since then, but was the, the onset of companies like Google and Amazon that were making it, um, they were being a little more transparent with things like their campuses that they were, had, like for their businesses or for their places where they were located and all these perks like that's that's really my point here is the the kind of life work balance or the fact that they had these cafeterias or they had workout centers and all these things so it kind of painted this picture of like hey when you leave college where you also have all these amenities you have a gym and a cafeteria and all this stuff you can then go join the workforce and it will if it's a good company and if they're worth if they're worth your time they will have all this stuff too Mm -hmm. and uh, that may be becoming more common in some places, but it's definitely not everywhere. And you also realize that it's not really the end all be all that you thought it was too. It's just kind of a shiny thing that, that looks intriguing. What were the, uh, what were the, what were your peers jump, you know, what were your peers attracted to? Were they, were they listening more to a career path or were they listening more to the, Hey, we got cool stuff. What message was important? What message was important to them? 
and that's interesting because I, I definitely saw a divergence um, <laughs> uh, kind of along that spectrum. So the things I noticed with peers of mine that had parents or relatives who were kind of career long, um, either involved in investing or some kind of something on the finance side or, or in accounting or something like that, they were more prepared to kind of go that route and, and put their head down and be ready for whatever it took, like for kind of the long haul, the, the maybe not ideal. So what, yeah, what was the, uh, what was the attraction when companies were recruiting on campus? Were they talking about, we got cool stuff or we got a career path? <laughs> um, so it, it definitely depended on the, on the company. And, and I think they were ready, at least at the time I was there, they were ready to kind of pivot either way uh, because there was definitely a, a spectrum of, of what the students were looking for, what the graduates were, were looking for. Uh, and I, one of the things I know I saw was the peers of mine that had parents or relatives that were deeply entrenched in uh, whether it was like investing or finance, uh, that kind of thing. It was kind of this like father, like son kind of thing where then the my peers would be motivated to follow that similar track. And maybe they knew that they were going to go uh, go live in New York City and work in a, a tiny office and put in long hours and that it was going to be really stressful and whatever, but that eventually they would, uh, it would pay off like financially or, or they would have more freedom or things like that. Whereas on the other side, uh, I, I did also have peers, they weren't concerned about the money part at all. They were like, yeah, the money will come. I want to work somewhere where I can follow my vision or be appreciated or have freedom and flexibility to travel or things like that. Um, and I think it really, it, it depends on the person, uh, but there's definitely a, a dichotomy there. So that was kind of the big, that was kind of the big point was, um, the big point was more about, hey, flexibility, freedom, career path, you know, money was a, was a lesser. What were, what were companies doing that were really turning students off? The companies that felt like they just were not up to date uh, really was, was the thing uh, that felt like maybe they had been doing the same presentations or given the same pitch, uh, you know, for the last 20 years or something like that. Um, and not that I know a lot about the, the recruiting process for those companies that would like come in uh, to the, the career fairs or things like that that we'd have on campus. Or we had some that would come and do presentations for our classes and, and things like that to, to have a little more one-on-one -on -one time or get to get a feel for their, their company or their culture a little more in depth. And you definitely, you could kind of tell the difference, whether it was their style of presentation or the, the, highlight, the bullet points that they chose to highlight, whether they kind of got it or not. And, and really, as far as like what you asked, uh, as far as what was like a, a turnoff, it was the ones that, that seemed like they, um, you got the feeling they had never even, it never crossed their mind that there could be anything aside from uh, the financial security and, and the fact that you could, you know, have a 401k to build towards retirement or things like that, that, that at that time, students at that age had maybe heard of, but they did not care about. Were they, what were, were they, were they, were they asking you guys, Hey, look, what's important to you? Or were they just coming in and saying, we're Acme Corp. We got, <laughs> uh, we got Wiley Coyote and a road runner and, um, you know, um, here you go. Yeah. Um, I think the feeling I got from a, what I'm remembering from a lot of the recruiters at that time is they would send the recent graduates like to the, to the school, which I think was effective, whether they were actually Notre Dame graduates or, uh, or from another, another school, but they would like specifically send people that were only a year or two out that could kind of speak the language of, um, or highlight the, the things that would likely be important to somebody just a couple of years younger than them. Uh, and I wish I could give you more specifics on what form that took. Uh, but I know it was one of the, the common things that we would, that we would hear about was really the, I feel like the flexibility and again, going back to the opportunity for growth, which is going to be important to anybody. I mean, anybody should, if they're career minded, they should be concerned about opportunities for growth. But if you have a generation that's more focused on, th that 
I'll maybe use the term entitled here, which gets thrown around at millennials a lot. But if you, if you are dealing with a group that feels like they're coming out of school as just hardcore professionals already, and they, they kind of deserve the best, you need to quickly make it clear to them, hey, this is the opportunity that we have for you now. But don't, you know, don't linger, but that can turn into this. Or if you, uh, once you develop your skills there, you can then move on to this. Like you don't linger on what the, the current position is. Whereas some of the others, um, like you asked about the ones that didn't seem to be quite up to date, uh, they weren't as quickly transitioning to the, the opportunities that could come down the line or the opportunities for growth. Okay. So the um, base, what about, you know, so uh, what about the tech? Are you guys looking at the tech aspect of it or is that like, no, not really that important? You know, when you look at a company's website and you go, ah, these guys are a little behind the times. Um, you know, what are you, what are your expectations going in? You know, you're saying, Hey, look, yeah, let me help you get tech friendly. Let me help you, um, you know, get into the 21st century. You know, what, you know, or do you, do you just look at a company's website and go, Nope, total turnoff. <laughs> Now, that was something I saw uh, majoring in marketing and, and having peers that were more focused on like building a brand and, and things like that, and, and whether it's website or social media management, things like that. They would look at that two different ways. They would look at that either as, okay, this is not a place I want to be. This looks like a, a social media guru or website uh, um, you know, manager like wasteland. This is not somewhere I want to be. They don't prioritize this. They don't get it. So why would I want to work there? And then others looked at it as an opportunity. They're like, man, I could revolutionize this for this company. Like I could bring them into the 21st century and what a cool project that would be. And what a cool feather in my cap uh, for that. And whether I, whether I stay with them for years to come after I've done my job or once I've, uh, modernize them uh th that's to be determined but but either way uh they would look at it as an opportunity rather than something that scared them away and that really just depended on the on the person as you might expect uh how people look at it as either a, a problem or an opportunity yeah so what uh, uh the you know what are companies so you, you know you you're, you work with a lot of smaller you work with a lot of entrepreneurs i mean it uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of fun watching all you guys do what are the entrepreneurs doing right out there that corporate America is not. What does corporate America need to be doing to attract more high caliber, high quality, you know, young professionals? What, I, what we've been seeing from our side is uh, kind of a, a ramp up of, this is going to sound funny, but just kind of being who you are or showing who you are, like with the individual entrepreneurs and clients that we work with on the podcasting, a lot of them have really embraced or the ones that have, that have flourished have really embraced who they are, what they're about. And, and what I mean by that is whether it's their, their sense of humor, their down to their, their style of speaking, like rather than jumping on a, if they're trying to do a podcast or if they're trying to do social media content or things like that, rather than trying to frame it, like what they see other people do, they try to kind of blaze their own trail and, and be unique to what they feel like represents them. And that's been really cool to see. And we see some, some other companies struggle with that a little bit where we feel like the content they put out, and I'm just using the example of like whether it's their YouTube videos uh, for content there or social media things, you feel like they just kind of took the template from something they saw somewhere else and are trying to, to put their, their label over it and, and cross their fingers and hope it works. Uh, but we've really been seeing a cool uh, kind of rise in just being kind of unique, not being afraid to represent your own brand. Does that make sense? Are companies, are, is, you know, do you find that companies, you know, it's easier for an entrepreneur to reflect his own brand. Sure. Do companies really reflect, reflect their brand? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, it's something that if I worked more closely with uh, like corporate accounts or trying to manage like something much larger like that, uh, I would probably have some different insight on. One thing that if uh, for anybody listening to this who pays attention on Twitter to what some of the other 
and I'm talking like large companies, uh, what they've been doing with their social media accounts. You know, for example, like some of the the fast food places, it's it's become a thing now for their social media to be extremely uh, like tapped into kind of pop culture and what's going on. So you'll see a lot of references like from from Wendy's or Arby's or places like that. You'll see a lot of references to music or video games or things like that that are kind of top of mind for at least for younger generations. And that's something that I I don't think we've seen a lot of up until this point. And it it, it will be interesting for me to see if that then trickles down to talking about like the smaller entrepreneurs and things like that. Like the sense I get is that the larger companies aren't afraid to do that. They aren't, a, they aren't afraid to kind of really reach out for those, those references or those funny things that would be a total miss on other generations. Whereas you get the sense that the smaller, uh, the smaller companies or entrepreneurs have to have to play it a little safer with, um, uh, with appealing to to a wider audience, um, but like I said, still wanting to communicate their brand and their personality through that content. Yeah. Do you, do you think that the um, the millennials are a little less afraid to take risk than maybe my generation? And I'm, I'm glad you asked about that. I, that's one thing that I definitely saw and continue to see, like with peers of mine that I keep in touch with. There's definitely a sense that if things aren't going great, for your current job or your current role or career trajectory that says if you have a trapeze net below you at, at all times, like they're not afraid to make the jump is the general sense I get uh, because they know, I think they feel strongly enough in their own skill set or their experience, at least at this point, a few years out of college, they feel certain enough that, that they will be able to f- find something for them and that they have enough like bargaining power, uh, I guess, if that makes sense, that uh, that there's not this huge fear of of leaving the one job. I mean, that was that was one thing I actually had uh, an issue for me was I mentioned working in insurance. That was my first job right out of college, and it was great for for at least the first year in terms of helping me kind of build a certain skill set and and gain experience. But I was, I mean, I'll say I was too slow in making a transition because of being, I think, a little more old fashioned of like, hey, I've committed to this company. Uh, they've been loyal to me. I've been loyal to them. I'm going to grow with them and, and we'll come out the other end and it'll, it, it'll be great. We'll, we'll have a, a bright future. And I, th- I think I finally kind of came to the realization that, that I do have the options and the agency to, to kind of make my own path and follow something that I'm passionate about. Uh, and it's not just about um, the financial security part of it. That was always something for me was, well, if I try to make a change, what happens if I can't pay my bills? What happens if I stumble upon this gap where everything collapses? And in reality, it's it's just not that likely for that to happen. Um, right. Anyway. Yeah, in a lot of ways, I mean, it's, uh, hey, look, uh, you know, my best friend just quit his job. You know, he just, you know, he's, he just quit and said, I'm done. And he's going to start his own thing. And he's wow. like, hey, look, at uh, the end of the day, I'll bet on myself. Maybe I'm be happier betting on myself than, you know, the companies I've been working for. And I think that's a huge issue HR departments have today is that the chaos that they created with layoffs and restructurings and you know, job security and recessions has made you know, the next generation go, Hey, look, maybe, maybe we just bet on ourselves. Um, maybe I think you nailed it to college. Let's, let's bet on ourselves. It's as good as anything else. Yeah. I think you nailed it. And, and I'd be curious to hear from somebody more experienced on this, what other factors play into that. You know, we all kind of get the sense that people are getting married later. Uh, there's kind of this, I don't remember the term my dad's used like this extended adolescence, uh, you know, into like the people getting married later that, that people more in their twenties and early thirties are still kind of living the, the single life and traveling and seeing the world and doing all that and not settling down until later. And I think some of that plays into the job market as well. Um, there's not, you know, if I was, if I was married and had a couple kids when I was 23 or 24, I would, there would be much more at stake when it came to, um, 
choosing or, or changing a, a career path or things like that, or I would, I would have to approach that differently. As is, I'm not married, I don't have any kids. And so I, I can take risks and I can um, be more flexible, whether it's moving for a job or, or other things like that. So. Do you feel that, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a general feeling of impatience from, you know, once again, the, 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 the squarely middle-aged folks like me, they think that there's a general impatience. I, I personally don't see it. Um, I see an eagerness out there. I don't see impatience at all. I see an eagerness. Um, you know, you tell me, what, you know, how long does how long does a 27, 28, 30-year-old executive give a company to before they start to uh, think about alternatives? Oh, man. Another great question. I, I don't know that I could distill it down to a – a specific amount of time, but I will definitely agree with you that I, I think there is a, what were the terms you used? You said eagerness, but, but first you said, was it impatience? Impatience. Yeah. Impatience. I mean, you know, yeah. Hey, look, you know, uh, you know, it's like a shiny object, you know, it's, yeah. it's like you're, you're, you're down one, you're down a path and you see a shiny object, you're on another path. Um, so the, yeah, that's sort of yeah. the, yeah, that's, that's sort of the complaints I hear all the time. Yeah. And, and my answer back is, Hey, offer the, offer them something, you know, ask them what they want, you know, instead of assuming ask. Yeah. And I, th- and I think that's, uh, that's correct to do. And the, because we're, I think we're, we're in a time where it's not as homogenous what people want. So whereas before it might've been, that a guarantee that you could build towards retirement or build this nest egg or, or whatever it is, or have security for your family or these things. Um, those, there's not, those perks are not as consistent across the board for applicants or for, for millennials as far as how their relevance to, to each person. But what you said though about impatience versus eagerness, I think is interesting because the, the difference there I think I see among my friends or peers is the, the ones who kind of get it, <laughs> that, that understand that there has to be a path of growth and there has to be some time involved in that. And you have to, you have to earn your spot kind of thing. They, they're more on the eagerness side of things. It's the, it's the, I'll say the millennials, the people, the kids that don't quite understand what it takes to be successful or the kind of personal and professional growth you have to have where it airs more on the side of impatience because they think that, and I'll blame social media for part of this. Everyone gets to see everyone else's highlight reels of their life and they get to see all these other people doing amazing things and, and being handed certificates and diplomas and keys to new cars and new houses and, and moving to exotic places for new jobs and things like that. And I think it starts to kind of warp people's perceptions a little bit of, of the reality of what has to go on before those things, before those highlights, and the amount of time and uh, and work that goes into that beforehand. Yeah, I mean, I, it, to me, it's it's interesting to me. I mean, it's you know, with the new generations coming up, I mean, you know, it's it's really funny. Um, I remember my mother twenty years ago talking about her Limoges china, <laughs> which was probably a hundred years old. Wow. You know, quite frankly, you couldn't give it away today. Um, <laughs> you know, Tiffany's, you know, you know, you know, nobody eats with silver, you know, nobody eats with silver in China anymore. Sure. Tiffany's. I wonder if Tiffany's is going to be around in 20 years. Um, other companies, which are just blowing up because, you know, the next generation of people, what was important to previous generations is just, you know, worthless anymore yeah. um yeah did you see that did you see companies coming onto the campus and asking hey look what's important to you guys when you were 18 20 22 years old uh, it's hard for me to say uh just because at that time you're so caught up in kind of the whirlwind of the idea of leaving school kind of coming to the end of 
your educational track that's really been on rails for you your whole life. You go through elementary, middle school, high school, and then college laid out before you. And then now you have to kind of choose where to go from there. And at that time, it's, there was a lot of buzz of what companies were offering what and and what friends were interested in what place and, and new cities and the possibilities of all these other things. And, uh, and I know that at the time, I felt like there was a push for companies to kind of show that, um, how would I even phrase this, that they, I think they were starting to understand that applicants weren't as concerned for the long run. They weren't talking to, to students about how now after three years, you could expect to be in this position or, or be making this much or et cetera. Not that you necessarily have that conversation initially, but, but after 10 years, you might expect this. Now our executives that have been with us for 30 years are here. Those conversations weren't happening. It was very more focused on the, the here and now, the first step is here, but the second step is there. And so I felt like it was a lot of pushing towards whatever that second spot might be and, and talking about the first as just kind of a necessary uh, stepping stone. But, but the understanding that, um, that students, even at that time, even in 2013, were already being more concerned with the kind of what can you do for me um, and and being focused on the freedom aspect of it, the freedom and flexibility aspect of it. And even a little bit being, I think being treated a little bit like, like you were somebody or something already, even if you had no real work experience, kind of being treated like you were a, a an executive or somebody that had to be headhunted. Um, when, valued, when, like a valued, you know. like a, a valued future employer. Or right. Employee. Right. And, and I could see if I was a, if I was a, co- a campus recruiter now, like if I was, if I was talking to myself uh, five years ago, uh, I'd be, it would be hard for me to keep a straight face treating myself then, you know, as, as some kind of seasoned professional. But I think at least uh, um, being prepared to, to talk with these applicants on those terms um, and the other thing is too that some of them are going to have a lot of great experience. They might have parents or older siblings that that have given them a window into into what it really takes to be successful uh, in a given industry. And they may have done some high powered or high caliber internships and things like that that might have that experience. So you definitely want to be prepared to talk to somebody who, as a recruiter, you want to be prepared to to talk to somebody who has their act together, is prepared to to take on a uh, a strong role or responsibility, wherever that might be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say uh, from where I sit now, really what was being pushed at that time, uh, just because when you're, when you're 21 or 22, or at least as it seemed to, to me and my peer group, we were uh, really kind of hoping to, to get anything that seemed aligned with our interests, like with the expectation that if it didn't work out, we've got this college degree, we'll pivot and make it work somewhere else. Gotcha. So there you go. So, so the gap between the, you know, Hey, look, so the gap, the gap is really not that broad. The, uh, the next generation coming up, it's willing to start at the bottom. It's willing to work hard to get to the next level. It's willing to do what it takes you know, all the, the, all that's needed to find success. But in the meantime, you know, you want to be treated like people that you are given the options and you want an environment that, you know, sort of meets your work life, personal balance. Yeah. I think the, the personal balance is, is a big part of it. Um, for the applicants or for students or, or young professionals that are serious and, and are capable, I think they are going to generally have a, a better understanding and preparation for um, the need to either put in the work, put in the time, or, or the understanding that that growth within a company will take a little bit of time. Um, I think we're just, there's maybe the, the spectrum between kind of those who get it and those who don't is maybe more broad now than it was uh, a, a long time ago. Um, but the for a company talking about what it can offer outside of 
just the um, you know the salary. I think the understanding that those perks are need to be oriented towards autonomy. I, I think is a a powerful thing. Uh, so rather than telling an applicant what they should want or what the people before them wanted, uh, like you've alluded to, is if there is the flexibility or ability to ask them what's important to them, uh, I think that does go a long way. Absolutely. I got you. Um, hey, so let's let's switch the subject. Well, okay, here's one more question for you. Does the fact that I can't program my iPhone just frustrate the hell out of you? <laughs> so do you mean, does it, does it frustrate me that you, like as an older generation, uh, like are yeah. not caught up on that. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, how would I explain that though? So I think there's an immediate, there's an immediate sense that even though that's on a very small scale, you're talking about, you know, operating a smartphone on a more macro scale, there's, it, it hints at maybe a larger trend that, that because we've, I mean, technology obviously has, has, been gangbusters over the last 20, 30 years in terms of computers and how they've been integrated with, with like every part of our lives now. But for the younger generations, they, the understanding that they kind of have this tool or they speak this language that the generation before them didn't speak um, is, is somewhat empowering, um, but also I think we're still within a time where somebody like me, like let's take the podcast thing, for example, it, anyone can make a podcast. The value like from our service is, is that we do kind of speak that language or we, we have the systems down to make that happen. So to kind of go back to your point, we're operating your smartphone for you kind of thing is, is really what our service boils down to. And I think we're still within a time period where, it creates opportunities for young professionals to maybe find jobs or positions where they can use that to their advantage or where they can be an asset to a company. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, talking about a, maybe a company recruiting that maybe, like you said, has a bad website or out-of-date website or something like that. There are still opportunities for millennials to, to contribute their skill set to kind of bring companies into the 21st century that maybe are still managed by, by older, an older generation that is not quite there yet. Now, what that looks like in the future from here, I, you know, who knows? Uh, once, you know, I look at my, my nephew that already like knows how to use a smartphone almost better than I do. And then I feel like I'm the one on the outside looking in and, and it's, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. Yeah, I got you. All right. So let, let's, uh, so, you know, final, uh, final question. Companies that want to reach out and make their product known to, you know, the up and coming generations. Is it Facebook? Is it LinkedIn? Is it social and digital media? Um, how is it all going to change? So social media is still, some people roll their eyes like, oh yeah, social media, do your posts and post it on Twitter and all that. But it's still a, a very real thing right now. I mean, it's, it's where a lot of the, you know, a lot of people my age, that's where they get their news. We don't, we don't sit down and watch, watch the news and watch, see the commercials on TV. We scroll through our Twitter feed. And if it's, if it's something important, we're probably going to come across it. Um, one of the things I would I've seen and, and I, that I think is a, a powerful tool for companies to get their message or get their product out there is to seek out the influencers for your target market. So there are people on social media that have tons of followers because they do something. They might be, I mean, they might be a musician or an artist or something like that, but they might also be, uh, they might have a podcast. They might have. A, they might be a host of a popular podcast. They might be, uh, you know, for the for the people my age or younger, um, Twitch is a really popular. It, it's kind of like YouTube, but it's where people stream, like when they're playing video games or things like that, or doing something like that. So people can watch. And here's you know something bizarre that you wouldn't have had 20 years ago. You can watch other people play video games. You can sit at your laptop and and watch someone playing video games and they're, they're kind of your hosts. They're like your sports announcer walking you through it as they're doing stuff. Now, as silly as that sounds, you see these, these, uh, 
streamers on Twitch that have a large following, they get product sponsorship or they get sent samples or whatever it is. If it's a, if it's a computer chair, a desk or whatever it might be. And then they talk about it to their audience and that's a powerful thing. So you've got this, this person who already organically, they've built up this following or viewership. And if you can appeal to them or connect with them, uh, it's a really powerful way to spread your message. And we all know that referrals, like in, for especially small businesses, you know, referrals are a huge thing. It's kind of this like referral atomic bomb um, for a lot of people in, in one space. So depending on the company, uh, depending on their service or product, uh, that may be more or less viable. But that's how I would summarize that is to find the influencers for your target audience, because we have things like podcasts or we have social media where you can see how big their following is. Uh, without that, if you met somebody on the street and they said, oh yeah, I'm a very popular um, yeah. uh, artist, you might just have to take the word for it. But we're in an age where you can see the numbers. You can see that they have 50,000 or 100,000 or 1.5 million followers. And if that's something um, that would make sense for a company, it's, uh, I think it's a really powerful uh, tactic. So that's where it's all going. It's sort of the power of the referral of the you know, Kim Kardashian, Kim Kardashian really was a part pioneer. Kim yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, as silly as it sounds, I mean, whatever, if, yeah, if, if Kim Kardashian, if, if, if on their reality show, she's talking about whatever it is, an app on her phone that she loves because it helps her with her workouts, like you better believe it's going to be exploding, uh, you know, the next day. So, uh, but I, th I think the influencer kind of phenomenon is, is uh, is very real right now, and, and it's not it's not necessarily a new thing. I mean, we all for years. I mean, whether it's TV, movies, radio, product placement is is not a new thing. Uh, but I think that we're in a unique time where it's not just that those that it's easy to to find out who the influencers are, but for a lot of them, you find them on Twitter or Facebook. You can send them a direct message. It may or may not get responded to, but but people are very accessible. You, know, you can jump on Twitter and comment on, um, you know, something from your favorite movie star and they probably won't respond to you, but you can engage. Like you, we have these avenues for that. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's strange and awesome. It's a whole new day. It is. Awesome. Hey man, thank you for, uh, thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon. Craig, I had a great time with this, um, and uh, I, I thought it was a great idea on your part to to even have this conversation or to hit on this topic. So this was great. Yeah. Hey, look, it's 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 one that needs to be had, and uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys all the work you do for me. Thanks for coming on. Let's uh, let's keep it going. That sounds great, Craig. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, James. Take care.